So we're going to cover chapter three. The beginning part is all about the structure of the nervous system, um, how we name certain things. Um, it's all about direction and understanding what we're looking at. So <clears throat> to start out, we're going to talk about how things are named and anatomically where things are located. So if we were to talk about a dorsal, for example, so dorsal here you could see like on an alligator is kind of on the top. Think of it like um, a, a dorsal fin on a dolphin, right? Um, dorsal means like here at the top of the head. <clears throat> so if you're facing it, right? So you can see dorsal being here and dorsal being here on the head. Um, it means towards the back or the top. Um, also superior is another uh, term that's used to mean on top or at the top. Um, supra also means on top. So for example, if we look at a particular structure in the brain, usually based on how it's named, we can kind of tell where it's at and what it's located at, where it's located at. So for example, the suprachiasmatic nucleus is a nucleus that's um, located above the optic chiasm. Um, so supra meaning above. So for example, in this case, the supra, uh, supra is above chiasm above the chiasm, uh, the optic uh, chiasm. Superchiasmatic nucleus is located um, above that, that structure. Um, medial, meaning toward the middle, lateral toward the side, a rostral or anterior being toward the front. So if we're looking at something with the word anterior, um, like an anterior uh, pituitary part of the pituitary gland, um, then that's the front part of the pituitary gland. Um, caudal or posterior is behind because caudal refers to tail. Um, you know, these in relation to where a person is standing is really helpful to see where we're talking about in terms of front versus back versus side. Um, and, you know, it's a lateral is being the same size, contra meaning opposite, being opposite side. So if I say that something's contralateral to the hemisphere, uh, we know that, you know, uh, the left hemisphere controls the right side of the body. That's a contralateral function. Um, that just means opposite side. Um, and so when we look at how the brain specifically is situated in terms of anatomical direction, we can look at it in terms of where would you cut that part of the brain? So what slice would that be? So for example, with the sagittal plane, this would be this sort of plane right here. This would be uh, as if you were to slice the brain um, directly in half, like between the eyes, for example. And that slice can be anywhere at any point in the brain, but the easiest way to understand it is basically if you had a slice going in between your eyes to the back of your head. So this would be what we would refer to as like a sagittal uh, slice if we were looking at MRI slices, for example. Um, so this would be the cut that we would be looking at. Um, if you were to look at, uh, for example, the, the transverse plane, so if we were to cut right down sort of um, from the top of the brain all the way down, you would get something that looks like this. This is um, what we would refer to in MRI as the coronal slice. And so that's just a different way to look at uh, a particular perspective in the brain. Um, and here you can see all the white matter here and you can see the gray matter here in the cortex. Um, and then finally, uh, this this uh, uh, right here would be the horizontal plane. That would be what we would call axial view in an MRI. Again, just allowing us to take another uh, perspective. So if we were to cut the brain horizontally in just this fashion, um, straight across, then that would give us this sort of view of the brain. Um, so if we are talking about looking at, you know, uh, a um, MRI slice, for example, so MRI is a 3D image of the brain that is, uh, the, the slices are collected in a way using a very strong magnet to uh, align the atoms and then basically takes a picture as the atoms go back to their resting uh, kind of phase. Um, but what it's able to do is it's able to capture hundreds uh, and even in some cases thousands of slices uh, just depending on the type of scan. And so you'll have a sagittal slice, you'll have a coronal slice and an axial slice. So you can pick sort of one location of the brain, let's say right here, and you can see what it looks like 
on the sagittal plane, on the the horizontal plane, um, and uh, the um, the um, transverse plane. And so all of these can give us a really good idea of what that particular structure looks like in any given spot. So this is the same spot on each slice that can give us a little bit better of a picture. Um, so for example, if you come in and you have um, a, a damage or a lesion to that particular area, then we can um, visualize it given different perspectives of the three different slices. And then when you put all these slices together, you can actually rotate the brain and look at it as a 3D form. So I want to remind you guys, we had talked about this before, um, when talking about the structure of the nervous system, remember the nervous system is split into two. We have the peripheral nervous system, and then we have the central nervous system. And that peripheral nervous system is broken into um, the cranial nerves, the spinal nerves, autonomic system, and autonomic system is broken into sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And then here, of course, we have um, the central nervous system, which is what we're going to cover today, and that's uh, basically broken into the brain and the spinal cord, and that's what we're going to mostly focus on today, mostly mostly being the brain. So <clears throat> when you look at how the uh, central nervous system is sort of uh, sort of built here. Um, we're going to cover some of these uh, individually, um, but I just want to give you guys an idea about so the, you know, the brain and the spinal cord being the central nervous system specifically here. Um, we're going to cover the brain and the skull and what all of this stuff in between, um, but this is stuff that uh, helps protect the the brain and the spinal cord of for different reasons in different ways. So here we have um, these layers here that are in between the skull and the brain, um, and we'll go over these individually. Um, these are called meninges, um, and they're uh, broken into different layers, and each of these have different functions and different uh, protective features. So let's go into the meninges. Now, I do want to warn you that, uh, so we're going to blow this image up in just a minute. Um, I do want to warn you that some of these uh, graphics are, uh, they're rather graphic. Um, and, um, you know, they are actually taken from cadavers. So some of this is, is looks, you know, very real because it is real. Um, and if you are also, uh, one, I think one of these images is actually taken from surgery and one is taken from a cadaver. So it's not the next image. The next image is just a blown up version, but the, the image after this um, will be uh, specifically more graphic. So um, looking at, and I'm going to just move forward here so we can see what this looks like. Um, the Looking at the protective layers that are surrounding the nervous system, you know, the, the brain is a very important organ and it's something that you really need to to make sure that has a protective uh, layer, has several protective layers, because we don't want it to be damaged. So think of your skull and everything in between as kind of like a helmet for the brain to allow to absorb shocks and uh, to prevent any uh, toxic uh, materials coming in and molecules coming in. Um, but the meninges make up the whole sort of uh, layer, a uh, set of layers that help protect the brain. So the first one is the dura mater, and dura mater translates to hard mother, and it was probably uh, a um, translation uh, issue, which is why it doesn't really make sense to call it a hard mother. Um, the word mater is, is probably the, the part that really didn't get translated very well. But this is a tough, um, uh, uh, at the outermost layer of protective covering um, that's in between you know, the, the brain and the skull. Um, and this right here uh, almost is like... A, you know, a structure that's like, uh, I like to liken it to almost like a wet cardboard, uh, wet, uh, thin, very thin cardboard. Um, like if you're making paper mache and, you know, you've got that kind of fat, that fibrous sort of, um, uh, you know, um, rippable, but also rather tough layer. Um, and can, and in, in, in during surgery, you do have to cut through this. And, um, in some cases does take quite a, quite a while to heal properly. Um, and then after you have the, in between the dura mater and you know, this is the cortex here, we have the arachnoid um, membrane here, uh, which is that web-like uh, membrane. It's between 
the dura mater and this right here, which is the pia mater. Um, and that it contains this, this, what we call this subarachnoid space, which looks like spider webs, right? So this kind of arachnoid, uh, it's, it's filled with, um, cerebral spinal fluid and fibers that, uh, add a protective layer. And then finally you have the pia mater that sits directly onto the cortex there. It's the innermost layer layer. And again, it's, it's a translated to tender mother. Um, so like dura hard, pia tender being, you know, really commonsensical translations of, you know, uh, in this case, the pia mater being a really, um, delicate uh, layer on top of the cortex that's actually very much like shrink wrap um, and very easily to rip. Uh, so here again, I want to warn you that this next image is rather graphic because this is a real picture of the dura mater in, um, in the case, I believe the right is a cadaver and the left is actually during surgery. Um, so here you can see uh, the dura mater layer here um, and here being pulled back um, uh, you know, is, is giving us a little bit more of an idea of what it looks like in the brain 